Chapter 2. I Love Her Moments later, Nancy and her friends saw a small twin-engine plane circling the airport. Sirens began to wail as a crash truck sped out. The runway that had been assigned the crippled plane was quickly sprayed with foam as a protection against fire. Oh, I hope they're all right, Bess said prayerfully. Ned was tense as he remarked, I understand the owner is a very good pilot. All we can do is hope for the best. The four young people watched tensely as the plane began its descent. Bess turned her head away and bit her lip. The plane soared along at what seemed to be just inches above the runway. Seconds later, the craft settled down lightly and sent geysers of foam in all directions as it made contact with the ground. Then, gradually yawing to the right, it slid sideways to a stop. Thank goodness, George murmured. Nancy touched Bess. They're safe. An open truck roared up to the side of the plane to collect the passengers and the pilot. The runway was far too wet with foam for them to walk on. Dave was the first one to emerge, and Bess began to laugh and cry all at the same time. For Pete's sake, her cousin George scolded her. You'll look a mess by the time Dave gets here. George's reprimand did the trick. Bess dried her eyes and quickly got out her compact to powder away any telltale tears. The truck stopped at the building where Nancy and her friends were waiting to let Bert Edelton and Dave Evans off. Bert was blonde and husky, Dave blonde but with a rangy build. Bess was the first one to rush forward. She gave Dave such an overwhelming greeting that he looked embarrassed. George greeted Bert less effusively but said, I'm glad you're safe. I told Hannah I'd call when you arrived, Nancy said so she can get the snack ball rolling. Twenty minutes later, they were all seated around a huge table in the cozy kitchen. Mr. Drew appeared and said hello to the visitors. Presently, he excused himself and went back upstairs to his study. Hannah Gruen had prepared one of her midnight specials, toasted ham and egg sandwiches over which she had poured a cheese and tomato sauce. Bert and Dave had never had the treat before. Both declared it was one of the best sandwiches they had ever eaten. I'll introduce it to the fellows at Emerson, Dave told the housekeeper. Nancy, said Bert, you working on another mystery right now? I'm trying to locate a missing mannequin, believe it or not. Dave laughed. That's certainly something different. If I recall correctly, you started your detective career hunting for the secret of the old clock and recently we helped you solve the mystery of the invisible intruder. Boy, that was a tough case. Nancy showed her friends the mysterious rug and pointed out the message in it that had been unraveled so far. Say, that's clever, Dave declared. Dad and I, said Nancy, are assuming that the man who sent it is a former client of his named Farouk Tamasp and that he's now living in Istanbul. Did he weave this himself? George asked. Probably not. I think most of the weavers in Turkey are women. But no doubt Farouk designed it and the weaver wasn't aware of the message. The rug was laid on the living room floor and the six young people dropped to their knees and searched for further clues in the border. None of them found any and presently Bess began to yawn. It's time to go home, she said. The others agreed. As soon as her friends had gone, Nancy turned out the lights and climbed the stairs to her room. Directly after breakfast the following morning, Nancy and Hannah sat down on the living room floor to study the rug closely. Tracing each leaf, stem, and geometric symbol was tedious work. In half an hour, they had examined only two feet of the design. They had found nothing and stood up to stretch. Do you think part of the message could be in the flowers in the center section of the rug? The housekeeper said finally. It's possible, Nancy replied, but it would be much harder to disguise it there. She noticed one place that looked like a pond with tall stemmed water lilies, but found no letters or words in that area. She and Hannah worked diligently, and five minutes later Nancy exclaimed, I love... From the doorway a voice asked, Me? That's great! Nancy and Hannah looked up to see Ned standing there. 
As Nancy blushed, Hannah said to him, How did you get into the house? Ned laughed. Togo let me in. He knows how to unlock the screen door. Well, I'll have to look into that at once, said Hannah, as she hurried off to inspect both the front and back doors. Nancy pointed out the words, I love, in the border of the rug and suggested that Ned try to locate more of the message. Ned laughed. You know, Nancy, I get a big bang out of solving part of any mystery before you do. I'm going to try it now. Painstakingly, he studied the leaves, vines, and geometric symbols. All of a sudden, he shouted, I have it! What is it? Nancy asked. Proudly, Ned said. The whole sentence reads, I love her. I suppose he means the mannequin. Then Ned's face took on a look of disgust. You can have her. As for me, I'll take a live one any time. Nancy grinned. Just the same, I'll bet you could love a mannequin too, if it held something valuable. Is that what you suspect? Ned asked. Nancy shrugged. One guess is as good as another. Ned stood up. Now that I've solved part of the mystery for you, let's go. You haven't forgotten about our trip up the river by motorboat to that unusual bookshop. No, indeed, Nancy answered. In fact, I've been thinking that perhaps I could pick up some interesting books on Turkish rugs. Oh, I almost forgot. I brought you a souvenir of your new mystery, Ned interjected, pulling a cellophane-wrapped package from his pocket. Hannah, coming back into the room, exclaimed, Smyrna figs! Only now the city of Smyrna is called Izmir, Nancy put in. The housekeeper sighed. I wish people around the world would stop changing the names of places. I'm getting worn out trying to learn all those new ones. Istanbul was that city's original name. Then they changed it to Constantinople, and I must say I like that better. Now they've switched back to Istanbul. It's confusing. So much I learned in school has to be unlearned. Nancy laughed as she opened the package and passed around the figs. Hannah took hers to the kitchen, saying she would pack a picnic lunch for the couple. She had been gone no more than two minutes when Nancy and Ned heard her cry out. I wonder what happened, said Nancy. She dashed toward the kitchen with Ned at her heels. They found Hannah holding one hand over the sink. Blood was dripping from a badly cut finger. She was about to put it under the cold water. Stupid of me, she said. I was trying to slice roast beef with a butcher knife. Nancy offered to take care of the wound and rushed off for a first aid kit. While she was putting on antiseptic and bandaging the housekeeper's finger, Ned cut thin slices of the roast beef. He and Nancy finished preparing the picnic lunch, then set off in his car for the river. It's early, Nancy spoke up. Would you mind going by way of Satcher Street so I can drop into the shop Farouk used to have? Maybe the tailor who is there now knows what became of the mannequin. Ned stopped in front of Anthony's tailor shop and Nancy hurried inside. Good morning, she said. I'm trying to find a mannequin that used to be in the window here. The tailor merely shrugged his shoulders and shook his head. Speak only little English, he said with an Italian accent. I not understand. Just then, a high squeaky laugh came from a dark corner of the shop. Nancy turned and for the first time noticed a wizened-looking old man seated cross-legged on a bench. As she looked at him, he began to laugh uproariously, slapping his thigh and rocking back and forth. In a high-pitched voice, he said, You looking for Farouk's mannequin? Who do you think you're kidding? End of chapter 2